Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. What if I told you the story about an Alabama woman who was tired after a long day and was riding a Montgomery bus home? What if I told you she was tired of moving seats so that a white woman could rest her feet? What if I told you that the bus driver demanded that she move, and when she refused, police were called and she was taken off the bus, handcuffed, and driven to jail? If I asked you who that woman was, you would tell me Rosa Parks. You've probably heard her story many times, and I bet her name popped into your head as I asked the questions. And you'd be right. Partially right. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks boarded the Cleveland Avenue bus in Montgomery and sat in the seats reserved for blacks in the back. There was a movable sign that said colored to mark the dividing line between black and white riders. When more white passengers boarded the bus, the driver took the sign and moved it back four rows. The black riders were told to move farther back so the white riders could have their seats. Three riders moved, but Parks did not and would not move. Police were called and Rosa Parks was removed from the bus and arrested. Parks would later say, I only knew that as I was being arrested, that it was the very last time that I would ever ride in humiliation of this kind. Parks was tried and convicted on charges of disorderly conduct and violating a local ordinance four days later. That same day, 35,000 leaflets were distributed. The last half of the leaflet read, We are asking every Negro to stay off the buses Monday in protest of the arrest and trial. Don't ride the buses to work, to town, to school, or anywhere on Monday. You can afford to stay out of school for one day if you have no other way except by bus. You can also afford to stay out of town for one day. If you work, take a cab or walk. But please, children and grown-ups, don't ride the bus at all on Monday. Please stay off the buses Monday. It rained that Monday. It was the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott, and the African-American community would not ride the buses for 381 days until the city repealed its law on segregation on public buses. But we know about the remarkable Rosa Parks. This story is about another woman arrested on a bus in Montgomery for not moving from her seat for a white woman. Just nine months before Rosa Parks was arrested, her name is Claudette Colvin. While Rosa Parks' arrest was degrading and humiliating, She was a grown woman, 42 years old. Claudette Colvin was a 15-year-old student at the segregated Booker T. Washington High School. Their stories are similar. It was March 2, 1955, and Claudette Colvin was heading home from school. Her family did not own a car, so she used the bus to get to school and back. She and a friend were sitting in the first row of the black section of the bus, and the two empty seats across the aisle were open. The white section was full. A white woman wanted to sit in the empty seat, but the segregation law would not allow blacks to sit across the aisle from whites. The black passengers would have to move to the back and even stand up if there were no seats. The bus driver told Colvin and her friend to move. Her friend did, but Colvin would not budge. She refused to move and said, It's my constitutional right to sit here as much as that lady. I paid my fare. It's my constitutional right. She also had a more personal motivation. She later told the New York Times, If she sat in the same row as me, it meant I was good as her. Colvin and her classmates had spent the month of February learning about black history. They learned how Harriet Tubman rescued nearly a 100 people on the Underground Railroad. They also learned about Sojourner Truth, who escaped slavery with her infant daughter and then successfully sued a white man to release her five-year-old son, still held in slavery in Alabama. She was the first black woman to win a court case against a white man and won the release of her child. That day, Colvin's class discussed how the Jim Crow laws were unfair and unjust. Colvin felt the spirit of those people when she refused to get up. She said, It felt as though Harriet Tubman's hands were pushing me down on one shoulder and Sojourner Truth was pushing down on another. History had me glued to the seat. When you hear about people trying to remove certain history books from our schools, This is why they're doing it. Police were called, and Colvin still refused to move. She said, I paid my fare. It's my constitutional right to sit here. Her books were thrown to the floor, and the officers drug her from the bus. They handcuffed her and put her in the police car. 
On the way to the police station, officers called her names like Thing and worse. They tried to guess what bra size this 15-year-old child wore. Colvin's mind raced as she wondered if they would try and rape her or beat her up. She thought she would go to juvenile court, but was instead taken to an adult jail and placed in a cell without a chance to call someone for help. There were 12 of Colvin's classmates on that bus, and they told her mother and minister what happened. Her minister bailed her out of jail. In juvenile court, Colvin declared herself not guilty but was convicted of disturbing the peace, violating segregation laws, and assaulting a police officer. The police report said that after officers got her to the police car, she kicked and scratched one officer and kicked another in the stomach. Colvin denied she did this. She appealed to the Montgomery Circuit Court, and the first two charges were dropped, but assaulting a police officer was upheld. The NAACP had been looking for a case to rally around and further their cause. At first, Claudette Colvin's arrest seemed to be the perfect case, but leaders backed off. They didn't trust that they would win with this feisty and emotional teenager. Colvin thought that maybe her darker skin had something to do with it, and others mentioned that she had become pregnant not long after her arrest as the reason they passed. Nine months after her arrest, another Montgomery woman was arrested. She was 42 years old, had a stoic personality, and had worked with the local civil rights movement. Rosa Parks was the woman that the community would rally around. Claudette Colvin and Rosa Parks are not the only two who protested segregated seating on a bus in Montgomery in 1955. Aurelia Browder, 36 years old, was arrested on April 19th. Mary Louise Smith, age 18, and Susie McDonald, 70, were arrested on October 21st. On February 1st, 1956, Browder, Smith, McDonald, and Colvin challenged the constitutionality of the state statute that enforced segregation of black and white passengers on motor buses. The lawsuit would be known as Browder v. Gale. The defendant was Montgomery Mayor William A. Gale. Jeanetta Reese, 64 years old, was also arrested in 1955 and was one of the original filers of Browder v. Gale. She would leave the lawsuit due to intimidation before going to trial. I mentioned the ages of each of these women because of the range of ages and how the law affected everyone, no matter their age or social standing. The four remaining women testified before a three-judge panel. When Colvin was asked on the stand why she would not move to another seat, she replied, Because we were treated wrong, dirty, and nasty. On June 13, 1956, the court ruled that the laws were unconstitutional based on equal protection under the 14th Amendment. Appealed by the city and state, the case went to the United States Supreme Court. And on November 13, 1956, it affirmed the lower court's ruling. On December 17, it declined an appeal by the city and state to reconsider. And on December 20, it ordered the state to desegregate its buses. Now, you probably noticed that Rosa Parks was not part of the lawsuit. Attorney Fred Gray decided that the courts would perceive that they were trying to circumvent her prosecution. Her charges were working their way through the Alabama state court system then. So what happened to Claudette Colvin? She gave birth to her son in 1956 and stayed in Montgomery until Browder v. Gale was settled. In 1958, she moved to New York City the year after Rosa Parks left for Detroit. She raised her family, earned her GED, and worked as a nurse's aide until she retired in 2004. She rarely told her story. I'd never heard Colvin's story until I saw an episode of Drunk History on Comedy Central. In the episode Montgomery from Season 2, a very intoxicated Amber Ruffin tells the story of Claudette Colvin while actors act out her narration. It was a lighthearted way of telling Colvin's story. It also made me want to learn more about her. In 2005, Colvin spoke to the Montgomery advertiser about what she did on that bus in 1955. I feel very, very proud of what I did, she said. I do feel like what I did was a spark and it caught on. And when asked about how she felt about Rosa Parks becoming an icon of the civil rights and not her, she said, I'm not disappointed. Let the people know Rosa Parks was the right person for the boycott, but also let them know that the attorneys took four other women to the Supreme Court to challenge the law that led to the end of segregation. Colvin did not see glory and she did not want more attention. What she did want was to have her arrest records expunged. Colvin continued to believe that she did not assault those police officers, and she wanted to set the record straight. She had also been placed on indefinite probation, 
and had never known if it had ended or if she lived under the threat of being returned to jail if she broke the terms of that probation. In October 2021, Colvin filed a petition in Montgomery County to have her record of assault deleted, and she had the support of District Attorney Daryl Bailey. On November 24th, Judge Calvin Williams signed the order to destroy her records and any reference to her arrest. The next time you hear about Rosa Parks, don't forget about Claudette Colvin and the other women and men who were arrested for their constitutional right to sit where they wanted on the bus. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Alabama Short Stories podcast. If you enjoyed listening, I would appreciate it if you would rate it and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify if you listen there. And if you know someone who might like to hear these stories, share this episode with them and encourage them to subscribe. You can also support the podcast by purchasing the companion book from Amazon.com, which features the first three seasons of the podcast. Thanks again, and see you next time on Alabama Short Stories.